Good morning. Here we are at issue 35, and we are speaking with Jennifer Randolph. Good morning, Jennifer, Travis. Good morning. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and, and where you work and what you do? Absolutely. So I am the executive director of case management and operations with the nonprofit organization DNA Dope Project. And we work with law enforcement, medical examiners, and coroners to help them with their unresolved, unidentified human remains cases. So as a nonprofit, we have a humanitarian mission. We believe that every individual deserves the dignity of being memorialized with their name, and families deserve answers, even if it's you know, not the answers they might have hoped for. So we actually provide our services for free. Our genealogy research is provided for free to agencies, no matter how long a case takes. So that's sort of our way of, of making sure everyone has an opportunity to be identified. That's spectacular. How do you get funding for such a for such an operation? Because oh. this sounds big. <laughs> well, sounds like it, DNA it, Doe is big. It, it, it is. We are the largest and oldest nonprofit doing this kind of work in this space. And we have resolved over 120 cases to date, with another 120 in the pipeline. But uh, funding is a huge obstacle, as you might imagine. As more and more agencies have heard about the success of this technique, it's become very popular and demand has, of course, gone way up. Um, the genealogy research we always provide pro bono or for free, but also if an agency doesn't have the resources to develop the specific kind of DNA profile we need to do our work, we will try and fund that as well. But that can run into the thousands and thousands of dollars with the lab work and upload fees. So we also try to fund that, but it's challenging. As a nonprofit, we have a large group of people who support our work, but they're usually small donors, you know, $10 mm -hmm. a month, that kind of thing. So it is a challenge and we're always, you know, we're scrappy and always trying to find more ways to get more funding so we can help with more cases. So how many people do you have like on staff? Like how many people are doing this work with you and for you? We have over 100 dedicated volunteers who are volunteers. genetic, yes, who are genetic genealogists. Okay. And they are donating their time and talent. And that's why we can offer the genealogy pro bono for free at no cost. And I will tell you, we have worked cases as long as five years. Some of them are really challenging, but we can put that time in and the cost to the agency is nothing. So whether it's a three hour case or a five year case, it doesn't cost them anything. And that means that even if our dough comes from a challenging population where it's really tough work, we can, they can still send the case to us and we can work it and it's not going to break the bank. They still have a chance to be identified. And that's another thing that's really important to us that no matter what population they come from, how challenging the case is, they at least have that opportunity to be identified. And if someone is, when you have identified these 120 folks, which is an amazing number, do the volunteers, do they find out about this? Like, are they in the know? They, is there some way that they're all notified and so they can share in that? Yes, triumph? that's an important part of our, our morale is celebrating each other's successes. We work in teams. Generally, a team of four is on each case. And of course, we're just providing a lead to our client, uh, law enforcement or a medical examiner. And then they have to confirm the information. Um, they will let us know when it is confirmed. And then we are able to share within our group that, hey, we've had another success here. Um, and that, you know, we all share in each other's successes and, and love to hear it when another team has been able to crack a case, especially if it's been one of these really, really hard ones. Can you describe for me what is one of the really, really hard ones? Maybe one that's not yet been solved that you're working on really hard right now. Generally speaking, the cases that are really challenging are Hispanic cases really? and sometimes Asian cases. Okay. So we have populations that are not only underrepresented in the databases we're allowed to use, okay. which are DNA Justice, GEDmatch, and Family Tree DNA. Okay. So they're heavily skewed towards certain populations. So it's a challenge there because you don't have good, what we call DNA matches, but also accessing the, the records to build the family trees, there can be obstacles there as well. So it's sort of a double whammy. So those tend to be really, really tough cases, the five-year cases, right? And we have others we've been working on that long that still aren't resolved. Um, we take all sorts of cases. Some are, you know, have been cold for decades. Um, others, 
are more recent, you know, and all the usual ways of identification have been exhausted, right? They're in CODIS, they're in NamUs. Agency has tried all the usual things and they just haven't been able to do it. We also take on some historical cases. So a recent project is uh, trying to identify some of the victims of the 1930s Cleveland torso killer. So, yes, very interesting case. Sounds cases. gruesome, but yes, it 1930s. Is. <laughs> yes, this was a serial killer in Cleveland, sort of a, a U.S. version of Jack the Ripper. Oh my. And he had 13 or 14 victims, and only two have ever been definitively identified. So we have a great oh partnership. Gosh. I know. <laughs> we, have, we have a great partnership with Cuyahoga County, okay. and we are working on um, locating where the victims are in a potter's field. Um, exhuming them and hopefully we're going to be able to identify them. So they're not even marked? No, no. So there are so many challenges with oh this project, but um, we have so many dedicated people, yeah. you know, at the medical examiner's office and certainly on our end. And, and do you have to work with them to have a body exhumed or things yes, like that? Too? Yes, right. So yep. you're doing that work as well? Well, we work, we work with them okay. and um, I was actually able to attend the first exhumation, wow. um, which was, you know, a learning experience for me. But boy, those, those four folks work really, really hard and I was so impressed with how dedicated they are. And, and really want to see these people identified too. You know, th these were so long ago, it's unlikely they have living relatives right. who knew them. Right. But, you know, the stories of someone missing in a family, that can get passed down for generations. So there could be people who know someone in their family went missing and, and this might give them answers. So it's still important work, even though it was from so long yeah. ago. Yeah. And the respect of life and all of those Exactly. You know, things that are happening in that world, you know, through doing that and exhuming a body or taking care of those yeah. people, right, yes. that are there, buried there, the remains. That's amazing work. Yeah, yeah. It's really, it's, it, has, it must be fulfilling. I was going to say, of all the jobs I've had, this is okay. a later in life <laughs> career okay. change for me, as you can see, but this has definitely been the most fulfilling work I've ever done, and I, I feel just very fortunate to be in the position I'm in. I really do. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me. Well, thank and you. We'll see you around All at right. HE36, maybe? Absolutely, we will be there. All thank right. you very thank much. Thank you so much, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, bye bye.